hope this is the last time we'll have to do a Zoom type of meeting, but last year we'll have these type of meetings. Before we start, I always like to acknowledge the people that make it look good. These are the brilliant folks in the lab. Uh, not only is it the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons that um, help us out with animal research, but got a great staff, Isaac Swing, Kizzy Owen, Owen Cochran, amongst many others. This is a picture that uh, you guys have heard a lot about already. And so the speakers before me did a great job um, talking about the science and, and some of the uh, scientific methods used to validate um, the, uh, the the experience product. This is um, something that was also very interesting for us um, as a man of science. So you can see these sheep are pretty nervous. We did a lot of animal studies. Uh, we do a lot of, of, of materials and biomaterials research. And obviously orthopedics is a great uh, uh, venue for these specific new technologies coming out, these new biomaterials. And this is an example of uh, a standard model um, that many of you should be familiar with relative to biomaterials and how they're validated before they actually make it into an implant and a material considered for the design of various devices that are ultimately implanted. And as a part of that scientific method, when we look at the models used, it's not just the large animals that you find in the way of a long, uh, 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 long bone type of model, um, but, but they can also be used in rabbits and the, with their limitations. This is an example of a recent study that we conducted looking at the distal femur and looking at a rather large uh, biomaterial. Um, this is PEAK, which has been used in spine to, uh, to and to some extent other orthopedic applications. But um, we wanted to understand a little bit about the bone implant interface. And through this specific study design, we were taking a look at the implantable material, looking at the material itself. In the absence of any specific function, we wanted to understand the bone implant interface. Lo and behold, as we looked at some of the outcomes, micro CT was mentioned earlier this evening as well great analytic technique. When you start looking at that bone implant interface and depending at the time of sacrifice of the animal, it will tell you a lot about the host bone environment. And one of the things we notice is that not only is it material dependent, but like your patients, like the clinic setting, if there's an infection involved, it often mitigates our understanding of the material, cloud the issue. And certainly in the evaluation of these materials, an infection has a deleterious effect as it does clinically on the outcome. If you look at some of the histologic uh, examination of these specimens after harvest, this is a good comparison of what you would be able to see. This is a micro CT of uh, one of the slides and the histological staining that was done on the right side. This is the bone implant interface under uh, uh, you know, magnification. And you can see that, that bone implant interface, um, this is uh, potentially what may happen if a biofilm were to actually form on that surface. Uh, the bad part and the clinical relevance of it is if you have this type of issue in a rabbit model, imagine what that may look like in a patient, particularly after an infection, and particularly if it is, in fact, uh, a biofilm that actually forms on the surface of that implant. Um, as you can imagine, just like the uh, high mag images that we have of this specimen, you can see the limitation. You can see that there is, in fact, a gap space between the actual bone, the host bone, and that of the implant material. All of the um, potentially problematic uh, when you consider the function um, of a hip stem, uh, uh, the tibial uh, tray, any other implant that requires a solid bone implant interface. And that, that really got us thinking, what can we do to mitigate some of the risks that we see from um, uh, the, the studies that we conduct in, in animal research and large animal studies in the evaluation of new biomaterials? So we, we, we uh, speaking with uh, our orthopedic uh, uh, colleagues, um, they, they were telling us about a, a great new um, uh, uh, solution, irrigation, that um, um, was uh, something that they were very excited about. This was the experience um, product. And as a um, anti-biofilm, anti-microbial, um, this is something that we were very much interested in studying, but not in terms of what it was doing. This has already been well validated in terms of the bio burden and reducing the bio burden. You've heard a lot of that scientific evidence already. But we were interested in asking the question, what it, does it do to bone formation? And when you have 
um, the uh, osteoblastic activity, the pre-osteoblastic activity, do these uh, washes, does the irrigation matter in ultimately the bone implant interface and bone formation at that bone implant interface? So what we did is we, we set out the, a, a good way to take out a lot of the variables and to get a, um, a good litmus test, if you will, was to take an in vitro look at exactly this issue. So, uh, be very much interested in using the SAOS2 cell line. It's a human osteosarcoma line, which has very much uh, the same osteoblastic uh, properties and characteristics um, to give us insight on what it would do uh, in local host bone. Um, very specific tests that we were looking from an in vitro standpoint included alkaline um, phosphatase activity, ALP, ALP, which is very standard, ECM deposition, how much collagen was actually being formed and laid down by uh, these cells, and then ultimately the endpoint mineralization. And you've heard a lot about micro CT and what that looks like in an animal model. Um, this is something that we think from an in vitro standpoint, we could predict with mineralization and a, a lizard red type of staining and telling us a lot about the in vitro response. In terms of this experimental design, obviously experience was the treatment we really wanted to see what happened. And particularly these two phases, the, matri the matrix maturation, um, the ECM that's formed from uh, the, 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 the cells themselves, um, that stage was very important for us to understand and measured by alkaline phosphatase activity. Um, and then ultimately the endpoint would be the mineralization of that ECM and ultimately the bone formation um, that occurred, uh, uh, mineralization being a proxy for all that. So quite exciting. I'm also happy to hear that in comparison um, that uh, people were mentioning clinically uh, the, the existence and use of betadine in solution, betadine as a part of the irrigation. Um, before wound closure, those things are exactly what we wanted to study because that's what, uh, again, our, our orthopods were telling us was a part of the practice. Um, when they were closing and they were worried about infection, often irrigation last steps uh, before closing um, involve betadine and betadine in solution as the irrigation. So those are exactly the types of things that we started off with. So getting to the punchline, when we started looking at these various concentrations of experience and, and at a five minute incubation point, we saw already dramatic differences in live uh, dead cell assays. And this is uh, on the top row experience in the various concentrations that were tried, including 2.5, 10%, 20% um, um, dilutions. And then uh, for the beta line solution um, that was iodine based, obviously, you were looking at the same concentration. You can see the dramatic difference in the number of live cells versus dead cells. Obviously, more dead cells starting even at the 10% concentration in a five minute wash. Looking at this from a, uh, a chart, statistically speaking, there was a difference between the experience and betadine, um, uh, you know, at these various solutions. And that started off at two and a half percent in terms of concentrations. If we extrapolated that and did a 24 hour uh, uh, period in which they were exposed to the uh, various concentrations, um, this also was dramatically different, particularly for the 1% and 2.5% for 24 hour wash period. And this is something, again, when plotted out, you can see the statistical difference in live dead cells in that particular assay between experience and beta dive. When we move on to out, uh, the ALP activity, um, again, this is something that we were quite happy to see relative to um, the, the, to, to the results. And then the ECM for the five minute wash tells a very similar story. When we at, look at different concentrations in a five minute wash, the amount of ECM being laid down measured by the collagen deposition after seven days, you can see a dramatic difference even at the low concentrations, 10%, 25%. Um, between experience and beta diet, and those were statistically significantly different. When we did the 24 hour wash, a much longer period, the 1% and the 2% solutions um, even showed dramatic differences. And again, the amount of ECM being laid down as a precursor before the final phase, which was mineralization. Um, this story, uh, I think, uh, tells itself. A lizard in red being positive, the amount of mineralization showing up in red. You can see in the experience, um, the end product, when you look at the last time point, even at a 50% in a five-minute wash, the amount 
of mineralization is dramatically different, statistically at all concentrations for the five minute, much greater than the beta dye. Um, ultimately, at the 24 hour wash, very similar stories for the lower concentrations, including 1% and 2.5% uh, being statistically significant, more mineralization um, for those concentrations, um, and therefore direct uh, excellent reflection of what experience does and bone healing. So in summary, when we look at what experience does, we know that it mitigates bone film. This is something that you had already heard about in the previous presentations. But what we were excited to report in this particular study is the fact that experience does limit, um, does not inhibit at all bone healing at the bone implant interface, something that we we're quite excited to see. And that was measured by the matrix uh, maturation as well as the mineralization phase. Again, this slide is repeated in the summary to show you the statistical difference for mineralization, even in a 24 hour uh, wash. And then finally, the iodine based solutions um, does at most concentrations inhibit bone cell formation, both for five minute and 24 hour period washes. Um, so thank you for your time.